Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal channel. The channel is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. That is, with wild animals or domestic ones. If with wild, they could be in the wild or part of a collection. Perhaps you want to work with domestic animals, in which case that could be agricultural livestock or domestic animals, dogs and cats. Whatever the species, we aim to cover it all. Every week I interview an animal industry professional, asking him or her what it takes to work with that particular animal. What are the skills and personal qualities needed? The skills could be an electronic aptitude. Alternatively, you might need to be flexible and have a great deal of stamina and endurance. These are the sort of personal qualities that we talk about when working with animals. My next guest has a PhD in orangutan ecology, together with an OBE for services to conservation. He is the director of the Sumatra Orangutan Conservation Programme. His name is Dr Ian Singleton and he joins me now. Ian Singleton, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. <laughs> it's nice to be here, thanks for having me. Ian, please can you describe your career from the start to date? Yeah. Um, I basically, yeah, I was a kid growing up in near Hull in the north of England, and I didn't really know what to do when I was a teenager, but I did read these books by a guy called Gerald Darrell, and I heard that he had this zoo in Jersey uh, with endangered species, and I thought that would be fun to work there. I didn't have a biology degree, so I, I ended up going to uh, Sunderland Polytechnic, as it was then. I got a BSc uh, in environmental science. <clears throat> I used that to sort of get back into the ecology wildlife kind of thing. And then I applied to Whipsnade Zoo and I became a keeper on the Africa section there with uh, rhinos and lions and tigers, even though they're not in Africa, and a whole uh, bunch of other stuff. Uh, I was into reptiles at the time and Whipsnade didn't have much of a reptile collection. So I ended up applying to Edinburgh Zoo where they had a more uh, elaborate uh, reptile collection. I moved there, but was on hoof stock working with camels and zebras and stuff. And, and uh, then I moved to the carnivores again. So I was back with tigers and lions and jaguars and snow leopards and all that kind of nonsense. <clears throat> and then I thought, well, it's time for me to apply to Jersey. So I, I applied to Jersey and the job that was offered to me was uh, looking after the great apes when the ape keepers were off, so gorillas and orangutans. So I moved there, and then shortly after the orangutan keeper left, so I became the orangutan keeper there, working with gorillas on weekends, and uh, was happy there for nearly eight years. During that time, Jersey encourages people to sort of get involved in the wild uh, populations of the species they work with if they can. So I used to, I came to Indonesia a couple of times, <clears throat> went to the forest, went to Borneo, went to Sumatra, and I timed a couple of those trips with uh, conferences. So I went to these conferences and met all the, all the orangutan scientists and conservationists and got to know them. And then uh, an opportunity came up to <clears throat> go back to the forest. I wanted to go spend more time in the forest. I didn't particularly want a PhD, but nobody gives you money to go and live in the forest for two years. So I ended up going back to school, uh, got some funding to do a PhD with the University of Kent, uh, went into Ache in North Sumatra and studied orangutan ranging behavior for two years and then uh, wrote that up in Canterbury. And then at that time, I knew that uh, one of the old conservationists, uh, Regina Frey, who had set up a reintroduction and rehabilitation center here in the 70s, was keen to get involved again. And I made, made it known that I was interested to work on that project. And uh, it was something I hadn't done. I'd worked with orangutans in captivity, in research, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could also top that off with uh, you know, this sort of captive orangutans conservation uh, and everything. So I told her and was offered a job, came here in 2001 and set up what we now call uh, that one, the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Programme. 
which basically does everything you can think of to try and help orangutans here, wild ones, captive ones, uh, reintroducing to make new populations, uh, research and education and all those things. So that's that's how I ended up here, in a nutshell. <laughs> That was a brilliant summary. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> what are the skills, experiences, and personal qualities that have been key to your success? I think, I think in the early days, I was a bit freer. My, I have an older brother, and I think people always ex expected him to do well, and, and nobody really expected much of me, so I was a bit freer to pick and choose what I wanted to do. And, and then... Uh, Ending up in Jersey was a big thing for me. All of a sudden, I was surrounded by, uh, you know, very experienced, knowledgeable uh, people in conservation with wide networks around the world. So I, I just moved into a, it was a different, yeah, a whole different world for me. Um, during my PhD research, I think I did well because I, I can live in anywhere. I had to get up at three o'clock in the morning in a swamp and put on wet clothes, go into the swamp for like fifteen hours a day, or even two, three, four, or five days of, on a in a row, <clears throat> I was traveling outside. My PhD was to, to follow orangutans when they left the study area and see how far they went and see how big their home ranges were. So I, I basically uh, went off on my own and camped under the tree where the orangutan was nesting in. And I have very low standards. So people say like, you must be like Ray Mears or Bear Grylls or something. I said, no, not at all. I just have very, very low standards. <laughs> I can sleep. If you're tired enough, you can sleep anywhere. Uh, and the other thing that's really got me through things, I think is, I feel I'm quite patient. I think working with the Indonesian government, you have to be very patient in the bureaucracy. I, I find I'm quite observant. So I, I tend to see things in the forest that other people don't notice. And uh, the, my kind of life motto is just keep putting one foot in front of the other. So like I said, I would, I would go off following the orangutans for several days, very little food, no trails. Uh, I had a GPS back then, but in those days, the GPS was plus or minus five kilometers, <laughs> not five centimeters and um so i i got to know myself and and i know that no matter what happens you know you just don't panic just take a deep breath and just keep putting one foot in front of the other and eventually you'll get to your destination so i think that's kind of what makes me tick yeah. that's brilliant thanks ian ian what three books or people or meetings have most influenced your thinking i think without a doubt uh i don't know if i can pick three but all of the books by Gerald Darrell. I think my teenage years were very much changed, transformed by, by reading those and seeing that, you know, anybody, you know, you can save species, you can prevent species from going extinct. It does, okay, the, the rhino is an expensive, challenging prospect, but many other people around the world are preventing the extinction of species for relatively little money and, and, and effort. It's not that it's not rocket science sometimes. And, uh, yeah, all the people in Jersey, like I said, were a big influence on me. There's one guy in particular, a guy called Carl Jones, who uh, was working in Mauritius <clears throat> and a single stand, you know, he was working with species like the, the Mauritius Kestrel, which I think was down to like two or three males in the entire world. Uh, and he was able to sort of go into nests and take the first clutch of eggs with, with some bird species. If you take the first clutch of eggs, the female lays another one. So you can actually double the population without harming the... Uh, the wild population uh, and hit, you know now the Mauritius Kestrel is like six seven hundred in the wild and Carl has single-handedly prevented the extinction of a, at least three species probably several more you know? and uh, and a guy called Carl uh, van Schaik who was one of the scientists I met when I came to Indonesia years ago uh, and and created the possibility for me to go off and do my PhD <clears throat> and he's been a lifelong sort of mentor and a couple of other guys a guy called Herman Reichson and Mike Griffiths who were uh, conservationists when I first came here to Sumatra, you know, for many years and uh, an inspiration. I've learned a lot from all of those guys. Ian, what is your view of orangutan conservation today, both in zoos and in the wild? I think the zoo population is stable uh, and uh, well managed. I don't think we need to we don't need to add to that or anything. It's it's a safety net in case things go horribly wrong somewhere else. Um, in the wild, I think, again, relatively stable. Uh, we lost a lot of orangutans in the 90s and 2000s due to palm oil expansion. That has slowed down, uh, not least due to sort of global pressure. Um, 
but we are still losing them. The big problem now is is sort of erosion at the forest edge, uh, you know, eroding uh, encroachment uh, and fragmentation. Fragmentation, put in, simply putting a road through a, an intact forest can split a population into two uh, and render a, what, what is a genetically viable population into two non-viable ones. Uh, and uh, the Tapanuli orangutan, the new species that we described a few years ago, is uh, down to such low numbers that we can't uh, miss any opportunities to boost their protection. But I think it's changing a bit. You know, it's no longer like we need to do more patrols, we need to get in the forest, we need to do this. It's more like we need to talk to the private sector, the big, the big global industries and, uh, uh, and electricity generating plants, palm oil plantations, because you know, we need to start clawing back habitat rather than just protecting what's left. We need to be increasing it and reconnecting it. Ian, how do you see orangutan conservation developing over the next 20 years? It's a good question, but uh, I think, like I say, I think we, we need to engage the private sector a lot more. A, a lot of orangutan habitat was lost to plantations, like I said, and as well with elephants. Elephants in Sumatra, uh, they don't like land that's less than, uh, that's more than a 15% slope. They will cross it, but they don't like it. And most of that land is now under plantation management. So we need to really start uh, figuring out ways to get some of that land back uh, and we need to, you know, start reconnecting. As I said, roads are a big problem. We, we, people want roads, but we need to figure out a way that you can build roads where orangutans and wild, other wildlife can, can still cross and will still cross, you know. But there's also exciting new opportunities. You know, the, the, the carbon trade uh, movement. So, you know, offsetting uh, carbon emissions by protecting forests in trees and increasing forests is presenting new opportunities. Indonesia is very much behind. Uh, on that, but finally getting its act together and developing <clears throat> new legislation that will hopefully increase the opportunities for saving forests with carbon funding uh, and biodiversity offsets and payments for environmental services, all these different ways. The, one of the big problems is, I think you probably understand this as well, is that you know, conservation has gone from something that a few tree huggers uh, do with, with, with donations from elderly people um, to the the number one global priority and uh you know we're still having to fund it with handouts and i think that's what needs to change we need to figure out sustainable funding mechanisms so that we can really upscale efforts and, and ensure that they carry on in the long term and that's our challenge over the next 10 to 20 years now. ian what can you tell us about the new species of orangutan that was discovered the Tapanuli orangutan, yeah, we, 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 we sort of announced that to the planet, I guess, in 2017, but we knew about them for many years. Myself and a couple of other people, we, in 2000, we went around and visited um, <clears throat> all the sort of major pockets of forest uh, to the south of the known orangutan populations, whether sometimes there were rumors and reports of somebody saw an orangutan 10 years ago, whatever. <clears throat> and we confirmed the presence or absence of orangutans in most of those areas. Most of them didn't have orangutans anymore, but we did find them in this forest uh, in a place called Tapanuli, uh, near the Batangoro River. <clears throat> and that's just slightly southwest of Lake Toba, which is the site of the biggest volcanic eruption ever known on planet Earth. Uh, and a lot of species have boundaries around, uh, between different species around that Lake Toba uh, area. So it's not surprising really that the orangutans are a bit different too. Um, but we didn't think that they were a new species. We just thought this is the southernmost population of Sumatran orangutans. Uh, and then uh, I think in around 2011, 2012, I think University of Zurich and a couple of the universities in, in Bogor and Java <coughs> started to do a genetic survey of orangutans throughout Borneo and Sumatra. Uh, and it came out that the, the ones in Sumatra were uh, in Tabanuli were just as similar to the ones in Borneo as they were to the ones further north on the island. So that was justification for uh, new species status. They, they look more like uh, Sumatran orangutans. Sumatran orangutans have these uh, big, broad, golden yellow beards and are much better looking uh, because of that than Borneo orangutans. And uh, Sumatran orangutans, uh, uh, the Tabanuli orangutans look like Sumatran orangutans. People say their hair is a bit frizzier. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, but there's not so many physical differences. But when you get down to the genetics, they are quite distinct. Yeah. 
Or but they're like also the, important. The they're, Sorry? Importantly, they're the most endangered great ape in the world. There's only a few hundred of them left, and they're already spread into three uh, fragmented populations. So we really need to do everything we can to keep them on planet. Are there any in captivity being bred? Um, that's a very interesting question for me personally, because uh, many, many years ago, one of the orangutans in Jersey, um, I sent some samples to an American student studying DNA, and he, he wrote back saying, this one, this one is unusual because it's, it's a smarter orangutan to look at, but it's very similar to Bornean orangutan. Um, so I suspect that he was a tabnally orangutan, and there will be a few others, yeah. There will be a few others in the captive population, but maybe not known yet until you do DNA testing. So it's one of the highest priorities in conservation biology, is it? Well, I think the zoo population, they've been bred together so often. I mean, if there are individuals, that, which there certainly are, uh, they've already sort of had infants and grandchildren and they've been moved to other zoos. So I think that it makes no sense to try and separate the species, uh, the Tapanuli and the Samartan orangutans any longer, I think. Interesting. And uh, what was it like studying at Gerald Durrell's educational facility at his zoo in Jersey? Like I said, it changed my life. Uh, when, when I was doing my my degree at Sunderland, I actually went and did a three-week course in Jersey at the zoo there, what we call the summer school that it used to be called. And all of a sudden, I met like 30 conservationists from around the world. And that just opened my eyes. You know, all of a sudden, I knew people in South America, saving parrots in the Caribbean, saving frogs. And, and uh, yeah, it just opened my eyes to this, that I could actually do something. I could make a difference. And, uh, you know, just being there around people who, who, who know their subject and are involved in hands-on conservation projects in other parts of the world. Uh, really, really inspiring. Yeah. Uh, best days of my life, I tell you. Be, being a zookeeper in Jersey is a, it's a fantastic experience. They do take on British people, do they? I, I looked into it briefly years and years ago and got the impression that it was for non-Brits only. Hey, no, no, no. They, they, will, they will take Brits, but they, because there are housing regulations there, so it's easier if they can find Jersey-born people nowadays. So back when I was there, though, most people were from the mainland. Most of the keepers were from the mainland. But they, uh, nowadays, if you're a local, a Jersey bean, as they call them, and you want to work there, you might be favored and what was it like receiving the obe <laughs> yeah that was an interesting one <laughs> there was yeah it's, it's something that you never expect and uh you know i remember watching this is your life you know when i was a kid with uh Eamon andrews and and you get people on and you know D gerald darrell himself was actually invited on there after he'd just got his uh, his obe from from buckingham palace so he went straight from the palace to the studio and I remember thinking, yeah, that's for special people. You know, and I'll never have one of those. So to finally get one of those is quite, it's quite nice. Quite nice to be acknowledged. So, you know, I've worked hard. It's not easy conserving orangutans. So there's a lot of challenges. You know, you're basically conservationists. You're trying to get people not to do what they want to do and to do things they don't want to do. Uh, and you never finish. You never sort of get to put a ribbon around the forest and say that's saved and cut the ribbon and go off on a, on a three-week holiday in, in the Caribbean. You don't get that. You've always got another problem over the hill. Uh, so it's nice to get, but the saddest thing is that my, my, neither of my parents uh, are aware that I got it. And, you know, they would have just been you know, on the floor in tears, I think, if they, if they knew that, that Ian, that, who they never really expected to do anything, ended up with a bloody OBE. <laughs> They never expected me to get a degree. I ended up getting a PhD, not because I wanted one, but because it gave me a chance to go and live in the forest for two years and, and to get an OBE as well as uh, something else. But my kids That's are proud. Even. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Ian, what's your most interesting orangutan fact? Yeah. Oh, I actually noted something down for this one. Uh, ah, yeah. The footprints go backwards. <laughs> and their their backsides are like chickens so yeah the, the backsides they, they they've evolved to to sit on a branch and do their business right so they and they don't want anything sticking to the fair so their backsides are actually quite pointed where you see you look at a gorilla and you see they have they have buttocks like like people do but orangutans don't it's much like a pointed uh, thing um but their footprints go backwards and that that's interesting because in sumatra there is 
there are many rumors and legends about a, a creature called Orang Pendek, which is like a, a small a hairy man that lives in the forest uh, and, and, you know, bends, bends small trees over as he walks and, and his footprints go backwards. Uh, I've, I've looked into this a lot and I think in the south of the island you get indigenous people in the forest. And in the north of the island, you get smart, you get orangutans. And I think the nearer you are to the north, the more the story is like an orangutan. And the more you go to the south, the more the story is like a, a indigenous people. But the one thing that orangutans do is when they when they walk on the on the ground, it's like this. So although the the footprints go the right way, uh, their handprints actually point backwards. So I think that might be something to do with the uh, the legend or the myth of the Orang Pende. And when they go through the forest, they also bend trees as they go. I have to ask, does Orang Pende exist? Uh, I don't believe so, because I, I, my experience tells me that there's no such thing as an animal in Indonesia. The rumors make perfect sense. So if you have, you know, bef before TV and Disney and, and books, and stories were passed down verbally and they didn't change very much over thousands of years. And I think this has probably got a lot to do with the legends of the Yeti uh, and, uh, and the other uh, mythical creatures or legendary creatures, uh, because these stories just passed down. And you can imagine years ago, you might have had a traveler in in the middle of Sumatra from the north saying, oh, where I come from in the mountains, there's this hairy creature in the forest whose footprints go backwards and as he goes through the forest and bends trees. Uh, and then you have some traveler from the south saying, oh, where I'm from, there's, uh, you know, there's these people live in the forest and, and all this kind of stuff. And you can easily... Ah, you're back. Can you hear me? I've got no sound, Ian. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. It's uh, probably my internet. Yes. No problem. I think we're coming back. Can you hear me? I can. You're a little bit garbled, but I think I can hear. You. Yeah, I've uh, I've got your your volume there. Um, we'll carry straight on. Ian, do you take on volunteers? Um, sometimes, but not as many as you might expect. The, the um, we run the sort of the only sort of quarantine and rehabilitation center for orangutans here in Sumatra, and uh, it is a strict quarantine, so we don't have uh, volunteers coming in, uh, especially if they don't have experience. Occasionally, we'll have sort of experienced zookeepers come and, and do particular things, like teach the staff how to train. Or, or whatever, new skills, enrichment, things like that. But we don't have sort of uh, Joe Public coming to the quarantine. Having said that, we've assisted uh, a few sort of groups. You know, you get these groups like Venture Force, Trek Force, whatever, uh, where you get like 15, 20, uh, usually young people uh, traveling around and, and we've helped them to do activities, but not in the quarantine center. And we're building the Orangutan Haven now, which is, um, We've got eight orangutans over the years that we can't release. Uh, some of them are blind, some of them are other disabilities. Uh, so we've got 50 hectares, we built nine islands, and these animals will be able to live out their days in a much better quality of life. But that's a, a big project. We'll have schools, education, restaurant, activities. And I think the scope for volunteers at the Orangutan Haven is pretty 
big. So I, I imagine once that's up and running, we'll be taking ball to you on a regular basis up at the Orangutan Haven. That's great. Ian, what's the most treasured possession in your office? Uh, I think it's, it's a picture of a, a little orangutan called, called Manis. So when I was at Jersey, uh, sadly, one of the females died uh, while I was there. And she had a young daughter who was two months old at the time. And I became Manis's uh, mother. Uh, now I'm a grandmother three times, I believe. Um, but uh, yeah, she, she, I had to raise her like a, just like a human child. She slept in the bed with me. Uh, I carried her on my back every day when I was cleaning the other orangutans out uh, for about two years. And uh, yeah, I consider she was my first uh, daughter, really. And I joke with my own kids nowadays that they have a, an older sister um, who's much smarter and prettier than they are. But, <laughs> but she lives in France now, I think. And uh, she's got like three kids that I know of, maybe four by now. But yeah, it's, uh, it was a, a very tiring time. Uh, difficult work, uh, exhausting, but... I learned so much about myself and orangutan too, and it's a part of my life. Ian, what advice can you offer somebody who's watching this who wants to work with orangutans? Um, you have to want it more than other people. <laughs> I think it's the same with any job. I, I always tell people that as long as your, your health allows, there's nothing you can't do. You just have to want it more than everybody else. You, know, you want to be an astronaut, you've got, you've got to beat the competition. Um, but... Uh, I think I always advise people to do what I did. I think uh, getting into this sort of career or this world, you've got to open doors and to open doors, you've got to get to know people. So I always tell people, do what I did, you know, just get on a plane, register for some conference somewhere and go and spend three or four days with you know, people in the business. And, and you'll suddenly find that you're sitting at breakfast or dinner next to the director of London Zoo and, or some scientist from Hong Kong or something. Uh, and, and making new friends and opening new new opportunities that way, but just get out and meet people. That's great, Ian. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think as as a zookeeper, I I learned very quickly. I worked with a lot of animals that are not the most intelligent in the world. You know, tigers and camels. Well, camels are pretty smart. But um, the, once you start working with the great apes, you, you suddenly realize that you can't treat them like animals anymore. You've got to treat them like, like people. And as, as, soon as, you, as soon as you realize that and you start to do that, they respond and they treat you like, a, like an equal as well. But you've got to treat them like people and uh, as equals. And the other thing is that, as I said, like uh, the example of Carl Jones, you know, one individual can prevent several species from going extinct. Anybody can do that. It's not rocket science. You just have to get out there and make the contacts and make things happen. Uh, but anybody can make a difference. And it doesn't have to cost millions and millions of dollars. You know, you can, you can save a sparrow species or a lizard or something like that, you know, um, without too much effort. Uh, and, and none of our work is, is possible without support. You know, as I said, you know, government should be funding conservation. The private sector should be funding conservation. But at the moment, we're still totally dependent on, on donations and, and, and in-kind uh, help and support and assistance. So, uh, you know, we need that to keep going. Ian Singleton, thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, nice to, nice to do a different kind of Zoom meeting from all the others. This is the Practical Animal Interview.